Hello and welcome to Ways to Change the World. This is the podcast in which we talk to remarkable people about the things they believe and the events that have helped shape all of that. I'm Krishnan Guru Murthy and my guests today are two people who I've known for a while, actually during the course of their lives in Syria. Wad and Hamza Al-Khatib are the people behind a documentary film, a feature documentary that is taking the world by storm and winning awards and getting amazing reviews because it is the story of their life in the city of Aleppo. For Sama, Sama being their daughter, is a astonishing film. It's, it's, it's very upsetting to watch in all sorts of ways, but it's a, a really unique tale. Let, let me just read what one reviewer said about it or a little bit of what one reviewer said recently. Wow, 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 how much of a difference there is when a woman makes a war documentary. The story of a young mother in Syria made as a film for her daughter to watch one day. It's remarkable. I would even call this a seminal film in the documentary genre. It goes on to say you will never forget it and hopefully more and more people will discover it with time and forever be changed by the story Wad tells. بحلب مدينتي سريه السعوره سريه نسام صور هذا الشيء اللي عم بيخلي معنا لوجودي ما حدا منا كان عنده اي فكره كيف رح تتغير حياتنا للابد I'm <laughs> In the last few days, you've won the Golden Eye Award at Cannes. You have your UK premiere on June the 8th in Sheffield. And yet it's only a year since you arrived in this country. How, how does that feel? Uh, actually, it's very complicated, really. Like uh, one year ago, I, we just like walked together to the officer at Heathrow Airport. And we were like all the time trying like to say, I need to make to make asylum. He said, no, no, like I went practicing. to climb asylum. So we were all the, all the way practicing this. At that moment, it was very, very complicated. We were thinking like, is that the right things to do? And we don't know what the future will hold for us. Just to claim asylum means that you you are you you believe now that you are not going back to your home for the next like five years, and just like you know to have this feeling that you don't have the hope to go, to come back, it's very like bad. But at the same time, like you feel that you are now in a safe place. You trying to live your normal life. And how astonishingly different from the years that you had spent in Aleppo. Now, now the film tells the story of, of your life there, living in the makeshift hospital created and built really by Hamza, because you were one of the few doctors who stayed in East Aleppo yeah. 
when most people left. Why were you there through the war years? Why hadn't you left? So it's a, it's a complicated question, but the answer is very simple. We've been there since the beginning of the revolution, the uprising in, in, in Syria, and uh, we, we made several like uh, demonstration, peaceful demonstration in the university, in Aleppo city neighborhoods. And uh, we just felt that it's it's not right when a conflict starts, when like they start to to shell the area, to just like to say like, oops, become dangerous now, we have to leave. Like we have several opportunities to, to leave. I'm a doctor, I can go and complete like do residency in, in, in Germany, in Turkey, uh, in, in several countries. As I told you, we felt like now it's the right time to be here. Uh, now there is like uh, a huge need of, of doctors, any medical provider, the uh, camera holders, anyone who can like just fill a gap because of the shelling that was happening on, on the city. He should just should be there. We, we've lost several, many of our friends. They were arrested by, by the regime or killed because of the shelling. And we feel that we, we have to be faithful for, for their memories, for their souls. So, what? I mean, you you were there as a student initially in yeah. Aleppo, yes? Yeah. What, what were you there to do? Uh, like, before it started, I was studying at Aleppo University, economics, marketing. Why had you chosen Aleppo? Uh, like, we originally from Aleppo, and my, my father uh, was born there, and we had, like, uh, a part of the family there, and... Uh, it was just like a good university and uh, like nice uh, community. How did you pick up a camera? Since I was very young, I always dreamed to be a journalist. But in Syria, it was impossible for like to be a journalist as you want. So my parents were like, no, you can't do this. You should do something else. And when the revolution started in 2011, uh, I was participate in the uh, demonstrations there. Uh, we, we were like... Uh, protest and making like stands. In part of the story from the beginning, you feel that there is something uh, uh, have been denied by the regime. They've said that there's no protest, there's no revolution in Syria. And the only way to uh, prove that was just like to film. So me, as many, many other Syrians uh, who were like activists or people in the street, we were just like holding our phones and like catch just what was happening really in Syria. What were you protesting against, Hamza? I mean, what was it you were, what was the revolution about? It was about uh, se like several uh, things. You think it's just like uh, a guaranteed thing, which is dignity, freedom, giving the people voice back, giving them the, the, the ability to choose who wants to, to run the country. What did it feel like living in Syria before? You know, did you feel oppressed? Did you feel that you were in fear? Or was there just a sense that you were not free? If you want just to think about those things, you will be scared. Like even if you had those thoughts in your head, you'll be afraid to be arrested, even if you're not talking with anyone about it. And uh, so you either like live a life when you don't think about the government, don't think about the way to make your life better, just think about work, getting money, uh, maybe leave the country to to study or, or work in, in other countries. This is like the main focus for our young generation when we were like in, in 2000, like from 2005 to 2011. There's that scene that you film where the student protesters are, are painting freedom on the walls. Yeah. Do you remember what that felt like? It was like a great moment, you know, when you feel that all these people uh, like coming very early in the morning, it was seven uh, in the morning, and they are coming to write something they really believe in. It was really, really great, you know, when you see like all these people is doing something very nice, very creative, just like to, ra to raise your voice up. I mean, going from a situation in which you were afraid to gather more than three or four people in one room yeah. to suddenly painting anti-Assad slogans on a wall yeah. in public, 
that's just enormous, isn't it? It's an enormous yeah. change. Yeah, and it wasn't easy to be, to be at that uh, situation. Uh, in the beginning of the revolution, like the regime started to kill any group of people who wants to protest. So we lost a lot of people in the beginning of the protest. And that's why it was became bigger and bigger. Yeah, actually, it's. I guess everyone has watched Braveheart film. So it just like started a small group of people like shouting in, in, in the streets for a few minutes even, and then yeah. just run. And then other people start to talk about it. Like there was a protest in, in that neighborhood. Like there are people can do this. Uh, human beings can do this. And then it started to grow and grow and grow and grow until we reached like, I remember maybe the biggest demonstration at the university. It reached around like 22,000 people. So we, we, we came like from 50 people who just shouts for a few minutes and just run as fast as they can to 22,000. 20,000 people protesting for hours and hours and hours. Now, the film is really the story of, of you in a very confined space, really, yeah. of the hospital yeah. with Summer, uh, who, who's newly, newly born. Um, tell us how the hospital came about. Basically, I'm from the western side of Aleppo. And when the eastern side of Aleppo was taken by, by the rebels and it was announced like an ungovernment control area, I knew that there will be a heavy shilling to the, on that area because we knew back from like other cities like Homs and Dara. So I decided to move there because there will be a need for, for doctors. And then in a few weeks, a lot of civilians came back to the area because it's their house. They want to live there. And uh, that's when the hospital idea came that we need to have a hospital for those people, not only for trauma cases. Because the government don't care about those people, don't care about pediatric, oncology, uh, cardiac diseases. They just want to to take over the city and don't care about its citizens. So we started Al Khuds Hospital, which was basically non, like a non-trauma hospital, just for pediatric, oncology, and internal uh, medicine. It uh, started with a few uh, people that were w with me at the first aid point. Uh, two midwives and around like five nurses. And I was the, the only doctor there. We started like, with a small uh, outpatient clinic and a small uh, uh, inpatient ward. And then other doctors joined, other nurses, midwives, and like the staff became around 110 people at that uh, hospital. And you basically built it yourselves? Uh, like the building was there, of course, but uh, it was there from, from the scratch. It was... Uh, a private hospital, but it, it was abandoned. We start to like, uh, we should have at our patient clinic, we start to bring some uh, equipment and medical uh, devices to, to start it. This is also a love story, yeah. isn't it? It's the story of how you got together as well. Um, so at what point did you realize that you were more than just friends, part of a group of protest students? <laughs> Actually, it's like, now I can see it's from the beginning. <laughs> While we were there, we, we can't say that. We lived and shared a lot of really um, remarkable moments through the beginning of the revolution. And when we were protest in the university, we weren't uh, like knew each other, uh, but we see our faces. So I know there's a guy it's, called Hamza. Yeah. He knows like me, Wad, but we don't meet actually. And after a while, when I moved to East Aleppo, he was there as a doctor. Uh, in one of the medical points and I came I met him again and I was like oh my god you are here yeah you came and then our uh, relationship was like being like close and close as a friends and then in in one moment when we, we after we like lost one of our best friends and then the situation was going worse and worse we were thinking like like you knew that I love you and I knew that I love him. So why we stay? Why we don't don't just like speak to each other that and share our life together? After we have like uh, expressed our our feelings, uh, we kind of like just wanted to to hold on a little bit because in the middle of all that chaotic situation, we have lost many of our friends. So this might be like uh, a real true love. It just might be because of the situation that we are into. And uh, like after a, f a few months, we said like, no, it's of course like <laughs> it's true love. We should get married. And I 
proposed her to her after like there was a massacre at the hospital and like in no time she <laughs> accepted. The film begins with uh, a, a moment where the hospital itself comes under attack and you're with Summer yeah. in your bedroom and, uh, and then somebody takes Summer away and you're grabbing your camera and you don't know where she is. Yeah. And an explosion happens. Well, how, how typical was that? I mean, is that the kind of thing that you were living through all the time? Yeah, actually, there was many, many times like this. So usually when any attack happened, uh, yeah, it's not just one, you know, and this is one of the biggest like things that the regime was trying to do. They have like double or or like one, two, three, three attacks at the same time. Also, I always like just turn the camera on. So when the first one happened, I was with Sama in my bedroom. So I was shouting, like, please, anyone come to, to take Sama because I want her to be in the basement if anything happened. And then one of my friends just like knocked on the door. So I give him Sama. So he, he was on the stairs going down and then the attack happened between him and me. So I was like, just wait for a minute because it could be a second one coming. So I wait for maybe like five seconds and then I follow them. And I was looking for Sama. I don't know where she is at that moment. The thing that amazes me about that moment is that you are quiet yeah. when that bomb goes off. You don't scream, you don't duck, you don't die for cover. You stay still yeah. and you're quiet as if it's normal. Yeah, yeah, because you, you, can't, you can't be scared because when you are scared and you do anything of this, you will make all the people around you like panic and scared. So in each moment, even like when anything happened, you should, you should just like hold your, uh, like yourself and try to be like silent as much as you can. Like this is the main things that maybe from 2013, we, we agreed on that if anyone just won't feel that he will, he's going to, to lose it, he should just go to his room or close the door, but just don't, don't show it to anyone because all the other staff of the hospital will, will look like at me as hospital director, will look at what, at that like woman who's supporting her, her husband, is filming everything at the hospital since the beginning. So we can't just lose it in front of, of the people. What did you think you were doing capturing all of this? I mean, what was it for? It wasn't for a documentary no. to be shown at the Cannes Film Festival, was it? No, of course not. Like the, you know, like the feeling that you are alive in this moment, and when the death is really around you all the time, you feel that how value is your life at that moment. I started like just record everything from the beginning with also no feeling how important it was. But it was just like for like keeping these moments as it's something really nice. And I felt the importance of that when I lost one of my very close friends. Who was that? Reis. Uh, before that, like Reis, even Reis and the other people around me were all the time like laughing at me. Why are you like ha filming all the time? And sometimes like usually one of them like going out from the bathroom and see the camera in front of like his eyes. So he was like, stop, stop filming, stop all the time. We need just like to laugh. We need to fight. Don't film us in, in all this moment. I was like insisting, no, I really want to record that life. Because I was also like amazed with the humanity, you know, and the humor that the people around us have. And then when, when Reis was killed, uh, we were watching all this footage, uh, like the, the people who were in the hospital. And we felt all of us that this is really important. Like we lost Reis now, but we have all these nice moments uh, for us all together. So it's memory. How was he killed? He was killed by an aircraft uh, bombing, shelling, on the way between uh, Aleppo and his town, al -Bab. And how did you hear about it? We were in the hospital and he just, uh, it was the second day of Ramadan. Uh, and they, he, he was killed with his brother, Mahmoud. They shared the first day of Ramadan uh, with us in the hospital because we were all like away from our families. And then the second day, they uh, decided to go to share the second day with their family. And they were killed in the way. We were at the hospital and we just heard from one of our friends. There are scenes in this film of what happened in the emergency room of victims of the bombing, of shooting, being brought in, which are incredibly powerful and very hard to watch. Dead people, injured people, children. Um, 
how could you live in you know in this you know uh, mo most people in that situation they have a life and then they go to their work you were living there right next to the emergency room yeah i we we weren't just like alone also like most of this stuff are are living in the hospital and even if you live like out in your house or something you don't know where your neighbor will be like shelled or you don't know where your ho house will be so there was no safe place in Aleppo or a place was se separate from what was happening now i can when i watch this footage or when i speak to someone i was like really like shocked in, in myself that oh my god wha how i really like managed to do all these things together but the moment that you feel that you know it could be you it could be anyone around you it could be hamza or sama so you feel that you know like i should hold myself and do this because it could be me next on, on the same hand that there are so many people who are like killed and injured but at the same time like same number or even more were treated and saved by by the hospital by the hospital staff so when you see also like those optimistic moments like the uh, the newborn baby that will give you like a spirit to live there like for for a year <laughs> to just you might save another baby like that the baby is a very powerful scene a mother has been hurt in a bombing and she's 9 months pregnant there's an emergency cesarean and then this terrible wait to see if the baby yeah. and the mother are going to survive i mean Again, you, why were you there in that room filming that? I mean, it's an astonishing thing to be able to film. Yeah, I like, I filmed a lot of things without any like reason, just like there's something and you should doc document this because all of this is an evidence about the crimes that was happening in Aleppo. So I was, um, I can't remember exactly, but I was like in the emergency room or something when the woman came and they like took her directly to the operation room. And I just follow her when she was go, like going down and I was filming the operation. There's a pregnant woman. It will be a baby, but when it's come out, it looks like he's, he's dead and there's no hope of like, you know, having him alive again. But I was like, okay, in my mind, this is also like a crime for a pregnant, it's baby. This baby couldn't be ter terrorist. So that's why I should document this. And many times when I was filming uh, like the nurse when he was trying to rescue him, I was thinking like, okay, now I will turn the camera off and get out because it's very like shocked moment and very sad moment. And then like suddenly, you know, one of the scenes when I was like, look at the camera, I'm, I'm, I was like watching through the camera. So when I like, when I've seen his, op like his eyes open. The baby's eyes suddenly open. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I, I looked through the camera and then I looked through my eyes directly to him like I'm like <laughs> am I uh, like imagine you know like it's it couldn't be like really happening and it's happened and yeah he's crying I was all the people not just in the operation room but in, in the whole hospital were coming to watch the the baby and it was yeah it's something really could happen and this like baby is really like more powerful than all the, the regime and all the weapons and all, all, of, all of everything. But I, I think that's a very good example of why your film is so unique and perhaps why nobody else could have made this because of the subjects that you've chosen. You know, in a, in a war film, you're nowhere near the front line. You're nowhere near the fighting. You don't see a gun being fired. This is, your war film is about the people, the children, the women in the hospital. Yeah. This is a story of, it's not uh, another one coming to the area to film what was going on. It was an eye from inside the people. Like I was one of the mothers in the hospital, let's say. There's many other nurses, which they are mothers and have kids. And like to film from inside this to outside, not from outside to inside. So. I, all this feeling and all these emotions, I, I'm going through that all. When I've seen like a baby was killed or injured or seeing a mother, I know exactly what does that mean as a feeling. And that's why why, why I was thinking, no, this is really important to document. And you, you gave birth there yourself? Yeah. I mean, what was that like, giving birth in a room in which you've seen so many people dying? I was just a woman there 
having my life. And then we decided, like, we need to have a baby there because this is my country. This is the place where I belong to. And having, you know, be pregnant with uh, a baby and you feel that the life inside you while all the death around you, it gives you a very, like, like strength that... Yes, I, I can. Yes, we still uh, we are still we still alive and we will. And then like to give birth in the same room with when you know like you shared the same room with many other people who been killed. But okay, now you give birth to a new life in this place. The very act of having a baby there was an act of rebellion. Is that what you're saying? Kind of in a way, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it just. It just feels like the, the regime since the beginning tried to make it impossible to live in east side of Aleppo. The main focus of bombing was hospitals, schools, bakeries, uh, aid like uh, distribution points. We had like famous joke when we were in Aleppo that if you want to be safe, go to the front line. You will be not, there will be no shelling there. You just try to find a house near to the front line. This is the safest place in Aleppo. When, when we have been living there for three years and decided to have our first baby because we're no different than all the other people there. Just being like a doctor or like a, uh, a filmmaker doesn't make us like have privilege on the other people. We're part of these people. We started the, the revolution for these people. Just to stay alive another day is a way to challenge the regime that we are alive in your face. How did you process what was going on around you, though? I still can't watch that footage without getting very upset. So how, how do you process it? How do you feel when you watch it? It's the same thing. You, like, you can't be, like, normal, you know, when you see this, because it's not, it's unusual things. The best things to process this, yes, yeah, to be angry, to think, what should I do f next for these people again? And especially now, like, all these stories which I we went through, it's... Now it's end and it's finished and we are now out and we are safe. But same time, like the feeling that this is still happening. And like just yesterday, a father was saying goodbye to two, uh, his two twins in Idlib. So how, what, what, what do you, what should you do to, uh, you know, to process this sadness and this anger to make an action to uh, like be the voice of these people or trying to do something for these people? and really to share the story with uh, many, many people around you. How did you feel keeping them there? Because you could have left yeah. lots of times. Before the final siege of East Aleppo, there were lots of opportunities where you could have just left, and you didn't. It didn't take us a lot of discussion to have that uh, decision that we we're going to stay. Just we felt that like this is the moment when, when we should like prove to ourselves, to the, to the people, and that we we are here for a right cause, that we need to, to be there for, 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 for the people. We know that there will be a need for any medical provider there. There will be a need for anyone who can document those moments. I understand that at the beginning. Yeah. But then Ward is pregnant. When, when your partner is pregnant, there is some sort of primeval feeling that you get that nature is responsible for, that you have to try and protect them. You know, you have to keep them safe. And yet there you are, staying in the war zone. As I told you, both of us are not from East Aleppo, but through all the time that we lived there, we feel like part of the community, part of the resilience of, of, of the people. And uh, I had that feeling in my head, I even not shared it with, with Wad, but like we have a lot of friends who have their children there. How can I just be that selfish and tell them that I have the opportunity to leave, I will just leave, but you're here for a good cause, please like stay and die, you and your children for it. Just like that, uh, that mixed feeling that we need to protect our daughter, I need to protect my family, but on the same time, what makes us so different between all the other people who are living there and they have no choice to, to leave. Did you feel guilty? Now or no, now. then there's a moment in the film where you where you ask Summer whether she will ever forgive you. Yeah, at that moment I felt that this is the moment really when I can't protect you at all, and it wasn't because of the shelling or the bombing, but because I know that the um, the regime soldiers were were very very close to us, 
And if they just like came to the place where we are, we don't know what will happen. The feeling of you could be killed in front of your daughter or she could be killed in front of my eyes or her, like her father. So I felt that moment. I wished I didn't have Sama. I wished I've never like met Hamza. And I wished I maybe I've stayed in my parents like house and didn't do anything in my life. But at the same time, I know like I did the right things and I really don't uh, don't regret anything I did. And now I'm feeling guilty because we left and the people in Idlib, they have the same experience and we just now watching from here. From you feel guilty for leaving? Yeah, yeah, of course. For surviving? Yeah. You can't like like uh, have normal life while you know like the other people still like suffering and and this is the same people who we were shared like our let's say like dream of a freedom with i hope that no man ever had to take that decision because like today i'm thinking about it it was just the the craziest uh, options to choose like i have to be there to at the hospital because i know that there will be need for medical providers but if I'm there like alone without Wad and Sama, I might be killed. I might be sieged for five years, like Al-Ghuta was sieged for five years. And I want to see my daughter. I don't want like just to leave my daughter and just came back when she is six years old. I want to see her grow in, in, in front of my eyes. I might be killed and then like Wad will lose her husband. Sama will grow up without a father. If me and Wad came together because we had that other option that we might went together, me and Wad, and just leave Sama. But then we thought that what life for her will be without having her, her parents. She, so that's when we decided that we will be together. Because you could have left Sama with your parents exactly. in Turkey. Yeah, that, that we had that option to, to, to leave her there and just two of us go to, uh, to Aleppo. So then we decided that just that either we, we live together or we, we die together. Like when we see a family that were killed together when we were in Aleppo, like the father, the mother, the, and their like children, we, we say that, thanks God, they were killed together and no one has to live the suffering alone, like with losing his children, his wife, and all of that. Just mental, you know? It's... Because not only did you keep deciding to stay there and not leave, you actually left Aleppo, you got out of Aleppo to see your parents, and then in the film, you show how you decided to go back with Summer and take Summer back into this. Yeah. What did that feel like? The feeling that I don't want to be besieged out of Aleppo. <laughs> you know, to be there, you will be more happy and you will feel like very satisfied that you are there. You can do something. While if you just like be out, you will be feeling that just like I'm watching these people. And in the film, you can see when we end, how happy we are, how happy the people even like who were welcoming us were very, very happy and that, oh my God, they came. And it could be, you know, like just a small feeling, but it's really, really means for us and for them and for the, the I don't know, for, for all the story from the beginning. We were there from the beginning. We were protesting for our like life to be better. And we can't just like leave them when the moment it's they, we, they need us and we need to be there. The world in some moment abandoned the Syrian people and like we will not do the same. And that's what you're doing with the film now? Is that, is, is that the, the only way you can support the people who you've left behind? Yeah, it could be because like my story is unique from the other films, which they were like about Syria or about war zone or about like the normal films but at the same time they were my story was wasn't unique like there's many many of the mothers who have children and they have the same feeling which i went through there there is many many like fathers or doctors or people who now living the same like uh, experience so what i i just trying to to do now is just to you know to share a story with the other people try the other people to feel their feeling when they watch the story when they will try to be like me, see see what was going on through my eyes. It could be give them some feeling about how bad was the situation and what we should do for to next to make these people life better. I mean, now, now you've been here for a year, you can see the extent to which Syria has been abandoned and forgotten yeah. by most people in this country. Yeah. It's not on the news. 
It's not written about. Nobody talks about it. Um, how does that feel? D- does it does it surprise you? It's sad but true. You know, like we we know that like people in the UK are more interested or have to think about like Brexit instead of thinking about Syria. And unfortunately, the propaganda that was driven by the Syrian regime and the Russian about like ISIS and they're only fighting terrorists, this is what makes like people think, oh, it's it's over now, let's start controlling the area. But the, the main thing that we really want, trying to just keep saying to everyone, even if we just accidentally have a small chat in the street, that al-Assad was the main source of, of the problem. The, it all started because al-Assad was in control. So now we're getting to the first point when al-Assad in control, and it will start it again. Uh, it will start again. And uh, Because he's won. Because he, he, he controlled the territory over the, the corpse of the children and burned houses and cities. But like this is like he, he won through power, but the people are still like, we're talking about 10 million Syrian people who are refugees in all over the place. It's not a proper victory, you know? And we can't say, yeah, he, he won, you know, because what the winner, like what, what this winner about, you know, it's like all the cities are destroyed. Uh, now, like all, with these attacks and bombing and weapons, of course, he will like take over everything. But we can't say he won. If we were in a boxing ring, then he won. But we truly hope that the world is not a boxing ring. I mean, you, you mentioned the propaganda and the messaging around who were the rebels, yeah. and that the rebels were all Al-Qaeda, Al-Nusra, yeah. ISIS, you know, the extremists, yeah. people who chop people's heads off. There were some of those people there, weren't there? Of yeah, of course, yes. So how did you negotiate your lives with them? Did you have to live with their permission? It's not about their permission or not, because we were there from the beginning, and then they came after we, we were there. Uh, the, but the, they had uh, guns, didn't they? Of course, yes. And it could be like we have a lot of like many problems with these people, and we are not at the same side, of course. But at that moment, you can feel that, you know, we are in the same area where it's like shelling by the regime. So you should now not think about this uh, issues and about wearing al-hijab or not and like being uh, m- a very good Muslim or normal Muslim or not being Muslim at all. But at that moment, you know, like you should just, uh, let's say, avoid their like uh, The differences problems. between you. Yeah, yeah. No, no, not the differences, but avoid the problems that they could avoid cause the problem, to you. Avoid their territories because in Aleppo, there are so many militias that controlling the neighborhoods. So, for example, ISIS was in Aleppo between like the August 2013 till the uh, beginning of 2014. So, and they have their own like small territory when we know that this is ISIS area. Similar thing happened with Al-Nusra, where like those two parties are the main like extremists in, in, uh, in Aleppo or in Syria. And uh, there are other territories that were controlled by several other militias. So, like when ISIS was there, we were completely trying to avoid going to their areas at all, not passing their checkpoints, and just stick to to the area where are controlled by uh, like the FSA, like the moderate uh, fighters. That's one thing that was also like through the regime propaganda that ISIS is everywhere, while it's it's not. Like the first question we had after the screening in Cannes where like the film doesn't show ISIS. And we were saying that, yes, the film was about five years in Aleppo and especially the main like last year in Aleppo. And in that year, there was no ISIS. So we manipulated people if we just insert ISIS pictures there because ISIS was in Aleppo for five years for only like five months. And, and they were kicked out by another by the rebels, rebels, you know, so it's it's. You can you can find your way to, to live there because you are speaking with people. Okay, they they are armed. They are fighting. They are maybe their mind not that open, but at the same time they will not just kill you because you you like want the freedom for for your country. So there was a lot of differences between each other, but you can just af- avoid uh, going through this conversation because you know that the the big enemy is the regime. If you just go to any let's say like uh, a a search uh, center around the world. And if you ask about what the uh, documents about how many people was killed by the regime, how many people were killed by 
uh, uh, ISIS and how many people were killed by the others militia or the other group fighting. And you can feel like, you can see exactly, it's more than 90, uh, 95% killed by the regime, maybe like uh, f uh, 4% by ISIS and 1% by the others. So uh, yeah, that doesn't mean that any percentage is more important than the other, but it means like to prioritize the, the problems that you have to deal with. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just wonder how you actually live when you're not, you're not one of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, but they are in control of your area. Is it frightening? Uh, Or do you feel that in that situation, you are all together against the outsiders, you know, the regime? Yeah, no, I, we can't. I hardly can say that in any moment, like I felt myself in one side with with those groups. Thanks God, our area that we were in was controlled by... Uh, Good people. Other say. other militias. In Arabic, it's called Tajamma Fastaqim. And some of these people were with us at the university. Like one of them was, uh, I, I know him from the university. He was one of the protesters with us and he's... Uh, Then he decided to, to carry a weapon. Yeah. Like and he, this is his way to defend his people. So there's like many, many people who you, you know that they shared the same like uh, thoughts with us when the we were... The original dream. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So even if they were like you know, fighting, but we know that we were protected by them at the, at the end, if the regime but, like came yeah, to this area. Yeah, there are several activists that were living in the eastern part of eastern Aleppo, which were controlled by ISIS and then Al Nusra. And I know several people who couldn't stand to stay there because they were scared all the time. And they moved to the western part of eastern Aleppo <laughs> to to live where like, they feel more protected there. The area was full of civilians. And like you speak about, let's say, before the siege, 300,000 of people who lived there. Maybe like all the fighters, if you just like gather or count them, it, it, they couldn't be like more than 6,000 people. Yeah. So like the area is full of families and uh, like uh, 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 like normal people. And even these fighters in, in some way, they have their families And they have like children and women and they we shared all like the same, uh, you know, like scared or fears about the bombing, the shelling, all these things. Did you always think you were going to live? To live? Uh, actually, I had, I would speak for myself and I guess maybe you had also shared the same thing that I had several scenarios all the time in my head that uh, I might be killed what life they are for they going to be like try to prepare that and it's very like mental to just have these thoughts while you are like 28 years old i, I guess i always thought that we will be killed Not you were always preparing for it yeah yeah how about you the same idea you know when 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 that attack happened between sama and me Always you have that, the, the worst thing. I was thinking that today when I, I watched it again this morning and yeah. I was thinking, what were you thinking? And it's As you were moment. going around the yeah. hospital saying, Sama, Sama, who's got my yeah. girl? I, I, were you, was part of you thinking, she can't, she can't have been hurt yeah. because I know where the bomb was, but at the same time, yeah. is she alive? Exactly. Every day when I was just saying goodbye to Hamza when we were at home and he wants to go to the hospital or even when we were like, Uh, in, in our bedroom in the hospital and he won't like to get to go down to the emergency. All the time I have this feeling that I'm saying now goodbye for the last time. And he will always like said to me like, stop doing this because it's give me this feeling and I don't want to feel that. Do you feel safe now? Yes, of course, yes. I was thinking if I like still alive until 60, oh my God, it's very long time. And you know, like now it's, it's sheer, it's, means like very, very long time. Like, yeah, it's, I guess it's the first time since maybe six years that we ever had a, like to think about the future. For the previous time, like we, we were just living day by day, thinking just for tomorrow, not even plan for next week because like, oh, next week is too far. And like, it will be very optimistic to plan for next week. While like when we are speaking about uh, anything and actually maybe 
the way that the culture here in, in, in the UK that what's your plan when you like finish your mid degree after three years? Like, oh my God, I have to think about that after like three years. What's my plan? Like, do you really have a plan for that? So yeah, we're adapting now to to get that min- like set of having uh, proper thinking about the future. What do you think is going to happen in Syria? Of course, what we hope, like, you know, to a good governments around the world will take the decision that we should remove al-Assad from Syria. And then it will start, like, you know, the new life of Syria. Like what I'm sure about is al-Assad will not stay in control. Like, I don't think that there is a dictator who managed to just stay and rule forever. He will be down in, in, in some point. But what... What worries us is when that moment will will happen. How many other lives should be taken in Al Assad prisons and by by Al Assad forces shelling until that moment come? Do you think realistically you will go back to Syria? Of course, yes, yeah, of course. <laughs> and at the end, we will have the justice, you know, and we will be back and we will have our home in the same place. And before we. You see, you're looking to us like, well, are you crazy? What are you talking about? Well, no, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's 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 great to see the belief, but I've also been in Syria on the government side, yeah, and I've been into East Aleppo and been to the hospital, yeah. Um, now that it's under government control, and you see what is left there, and it's very hard to imagine, you know, you being able to go back. I think we'll be able to get back, but not in the upcoming five to ten years. So it's something we should to do a proper planning for, like the no. UK style, for like maybe. But it's it's about when when the regime will like remove when the Assad regime will like will be removed. Really, yeah, will be down. At that moment, we of course we will be back. Of course, yeah? like yeah, this is the only thing which stop us and stop another ten million. <laughs> and, and what makes you think world. he will be removed? This is what I really like. Do believe that the the world, the life, the universal system couldn't be that bad, you know? You believe have, in good. N- we yeah, believe we that believe justice good, will be yeah. for this life. You can't feel that what we went through as Syrians, and in the end, he will win and he will take control of everything, and the other countries will be like, yes, fine, and good good relationship with with him as a regime. And to all those people who think it would be impossible because the extremists would take over Syria. You know, there would be no democratic Syria. There would be no ordinary rebels who suddenly take over Syria and it all, everything's good, that it would become an extreme uh, state run by Muslim extremists or Islamist extremists. Yeah. We will have another revolution. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> in the mid of 2013, we knew that we will have more extremists in Syria because Al-Assad make like a pardon for all, most of the... Uh, like in 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 this uh, like government uh, state, government claim that they will have a pardon for all the people in the prisons. But on the ground, what happened? He removed all most of the, he released most of the people from a famous prison we know in Damascus called Sadnaya, Sadnaya, which he kept all the Muslims, uh, the extremist fighters there that they were arrested in Iraq or other places. And we know that since those people are released, they will carry weapon, they will claim that they will have Khilafah and all of that, which we had never claimed in our uh, demonstrations. And uh, like most of the people in in, in ISIS were foreigners, They're, they weren't Syrians, they were from s- several countries. So if Al-Assad was down, all the countries take their bad people out, we can handle Syria. You talked about Brexit uh, in terms of the way that's what people are obsessed with here. Obviously, one of the things to do with Brexit was the refugee crisis prompted by Syria. How how have you felt? Now, you've been here a year. You must have talked to people and picked up what the debate has been here. What would you say about the way people felt and responded to those refugees coming out of Syria and saw it as a threat? I guess this is one one of the things that we want to... Uh, to speak about and what the film is is, is showing. Syrians were uh, stamped by like uh, 
by those like stamp of ISIS extremists. There are bad people. They're fighting each other, civil war, like as Syrians fighting each other. And the film shows that it's not. Like Syrians are like their doctors, friends, neighbors, laughing together, having their meals together, have a dream about democracy, about uh, living a free life. And their life had just been destroyed by, by, the, by, by their own government. But it just happened to be Syrians and happened to have a bad uh, government. How do you feel you're, you're treated in this country when you tell people you're Syrian? I guess maybe because we are in London, up till the moment, we haven't faced any kind of uh, bad, uh, bad situation. But I think this is not the Syrian refugees in, in, in the UK, how they are living. I think because we are in, in London. It was really good as some people, when, when they come to us and um, ask us about what like what's the life is or what happened with you or why you are like here or some of this. I've started like saying of I was working with Channel 4 News <laughs> and I've did like several reports. Like most of the people who I met even like in the bus or tube, they've seen something of this uh, situation. I wish that they, they can really understand our situation. And that's what, what part of the film is really about, to show all the people around the world that, this, that we are as Syrians, we doesn't want to leave. We want to stay in our country. We like we, try we, we, to... We fight to yeah. stay in our country. We, we risked a lot of things and risked a lot of things just to stay in our country. But then we just were forced to, to flee. We see this interview through the prism of changing the world. You've kind of already told me what the answer is. If you could change the world, what would you do? Just make the, the governments stand with, with their people and with the right causes for other people, not just for their own interest and like commercial and economic relationship, rather than just being uh, more human. How would you change the world? It's the first thing maybe to care more about the other people, to think that even me, if I was in a safe place, what other people are life look like, and to be engaged more, to tell the story, share, share their stories, and just try to think how I can really make difference in my life and in others' life. Well, you've certainly made a difference. Thank you very much indeed for coming in to share your story. For Summer is an extraordinary film, and I do hope as many people as possible around the world get to see it. They will get to see it on television, on Channel 4, but also in movie theatres. The big award for us really like to the life in Syria will be better and Allah like said to get, be removed. Get the people yeah. engagement with the Syrian story. Thank you very much indeed.